Thank you for joining this session on software architecture testing. My name is uh, Sebastian Rumler from Exivian. I'm one of the co-founders of this company, which was founded roughly 15 years ago. Just a few words to the company itself. As I said, we are around now for more than 15 years, and it originally was a spin-off from the University of Stuttgart. So we are a very sound academic background and build it up on that when we now build our tools for our worldwide customers. Our headquarters in Stuttgart, well, same as uh, Vector, and uh, we also have R&D offices in Bremen and Düsseldorf. And this is where we support our customers around the world from, with now close to 10,000 users worldwide. And this is why we're very happy also to have um, Vector as not only as one of our uh, customers, but also as one of our partners who also offers services and support, especially in the US and in China and uh, more countries to come, hopefully. So. Um, Thank you very much for that. And um, we have customers not only in the automotive industry, but also in the medical field and uh, wherever it makes sense to really take care of uh, good quality. So speaking about quality, this is what testing is all about in the end. And software architecture testing is an important uh, part in this um, software quality assurance effort that you uh, tackle every day. Those of you who are familiar with ASPICE in the automotive industry will know the topic under the name of software integration testing, which is basically to make sure that your software architecture that you have designed, that you have documented, is actually the software architecture that is implemented in your code. And this is what we tackle because uh, we found that if you do that simply with doing reviews, it's a lot of work to do. And also, by nature, you will miss out on parts. Because uh, when you look at a software, of course, in a review, you can always see at each line, so what function do I call or what variable do I use? But if I am that function, if I'm looking at that function or at that variable, that global variable, for example, I cannot see at this part of the code who is using me. And this is the big challenge I have in software development um, with that differentiates uh, the software development um, from, from also hardware development where I can x-ray anything and always see what dependencies I have. Um, but this is something I, I hardly can do in software development. And this is something what we tackle with our Exivian suite, um, which uh, has a lot of tools inside where you can do static code analysis and you can check do checks for Misra and for Autos RC++14 and you can find dead code and all of that. And I guess you all use some sort of static analysis, uh, even if it's uh, just a CPP check, which is not bad as a tool if you start, it's better than doing nothing. But maybe some of you are already working with our static code analysis tool, which offers a very, very deep and profound analysis. But what I will focus on today is uh, not the static code analysis part, which I just highlighted green here, but the architecture verification part, which I now highlighted um, on the upper right side here. Um, it is important, as I said, to also take care of your architecture and to make sure that your software architecture um, matches your code. And I will show you um, a small example in a second um, why this is so very important. Just so that you know how this all integrates into your other testing efforts that you have, um, our recommendation here is that you just simply integrate um, these analyses, the architecture testing, as part of your continuous testing strategy. So you just would integrate our Exivian suite analysis and our architecture checking analysis as part of your continuous testing efforts so that all the analyses are done on a regular basis. They're all automated so that developers and also architects do not have to um, do manual um, steps in this testing process. Of course, you can always do these things manually, but we all know um, that um, if you automate them, you'll get a lot of benefits from that. And uh, so our analyses would run continuously 
What we also offer as part of our technology is a continuous baselining. So we would not only know that there is a violation in your code, but also know if this violation is brand new or it's been hanging around there for years. So maybe you should tackle the ones first that are brand new because they have a much higher risk that they really produce uh, a bug in the end. Um, and, and also they're easier to tackle because they are brand new and everyone should hopefully still know why um, she or he did that in the first place. So it's important to have that continuous approach and um, of course, best thing to integrate it also into your um, IDE, whether it's Eclipse or Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, whatever you have there so that you have an integrated um, effort here. And now to that example that I promised you why architecture testing is so important to do. Let's just take a very, very small example. Um, we all know that real software architectures consist of more than three components, but uh, for this example, um, they, they should be enough. Let's say we have three components, A, B, and C, and it's a small embedded device, and you have some sensors um, where you have drivers implemented in, in C, then you have some application um, written in, that's the component B, and you have a user interface that you have in component A. And now you have a lot of code. That's C, C++, C Sharp, whatever you have there. And the big question now is, is that code still in sync with your intended architecture or not? Because it can quickly happen that, especially when requirements change on short notice, or if there's misunderstandings in the team, there's hundreds of reasons why um, those changes can happen. Um, let's say, you had another idea what to display or how to display something in your user interface component A, where you just need to display some information um, from your sensor. So you just want to know how, how cold or how hot is it at the moment. Then a good quick um, hack, let's say, would be to just directly access this information uh, from A. So why do all the hassle to use all the interfaces that were planned in there? Because the deadline is there. Um, you don't have any time to, to implement it uh, in a way you're supposed to. And it's just a prototype anyhow. So let's just do it this way. So there's hundreds of reasons why this happens on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm pretty sure that uh, you had uh, projects in the past where, where this happened, especially those prototypes are uh, a candidate for those quick workarounds here. So you just wanted to show something. The problem now here is with your regular testing efforts, you would not spot them because if the system runs properly, all your test cases will pass. Um, the information that you wanted to display will be displayed. So there will be no um, error report uh, whatsoever because there is no error. And that's the tricky thing now because the error is only there um, when you look at the architecture and the consistency with the code. And this is something, if you don't do software architecture testing, is something you will not notice and that will slip through. And this is where software decay, software erosion, um, you name it, all that happens. Um, what's uh, en vogue in the moment uh, to tell those software erosion or software decay is you have technical debt. Um, and uh, software architecture erosion is a big cause for technical debt in today's software projects. And it now gets really tricky if this prototype that you have there with that workaround will become a product and successful prototypes do become a product and you seldomly really start again from zero, but you will reuse the prototype to make a product out of it. And um, in our example here, it was just the prototype was just intended for the European market. So degrees Celsius to display degrees Celsius was just fine. Um, and now, of course, if it should be a product, you want to sell it internationally, you want to sell it in the US, you should have the possibility also to also display degrees Fahrenheit. So this is your next step now in your product development and your software architect might plan, okay, where can we uh, plan, do that uh, calculation to convert degree Celsius to degree, degree Fahrenheit. And it obviously makes sense to do it in the application layer. So you're independent of your sensors, you're independent of your user interface. So that's the place to implement it, most likely. Or it could, of course, be a good idea from the software architect.
Problem is that the software architect does not know about this workaround um, Wanda did for that prototype. So what will happen then after the implementation, you will have um, all the information converted in your application, but that doesn't help you because it could still happen that some degree Celsius information is still displayed um, although you had this uh, con conversion implemented. And this is where um, the hassle now starts because weird things can happen. Let's say at 32 degrees um, Celsius, you get a freezing warning in your display. So, so some weird things start to happen. And these kind of bugs that are triggered by false assumptions um, concerning your architecture, those are the bugs that are really, really hard to reproduce, hard to find, and hard to fix. And even if you do find out, um, oh, okay, there's still some information that where no conversion has been done, a quick fix could also be that you just simply um, do that conversion in A again. So you have, now have two different parts in your software where this conversion happens. So, and you have typical software clones, so you have duplicated code. Um, and if you want to change something, you have to change it in two places. If you forget the second place, uh, the second clone, then you'll have a new problem which will arise and this small example um, shows you how important it is to keep track of your software architecture and the implementation and if these two match. Because if not, a lot of bugs can really result from that. And this is what we actually do. That's uh, we take all the architecture information that's there. If, you have, if you're using a UML tool such as Repsody or Enterprise Architect or some other open source tool for that, or you use our own modeler that we ship with our product where you can model your software architecture. Um, if you have that in a machine readable form, we are capable of taking this architecture information, map it on your code to see whether the code really matches this architecture or not. So in our case, what you would get as an information for that workaround, you, will, you would directly have gotten a warning that A is directly accessing information from C, and that's not supposed to happen. And now you can take action. With this testing established as part of your process, you will not run into surprises because you can um, make a decision right now. You can either just go ahead and remove it in the code because they say, oh, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, you're right. I, I cannot do that. I have to use the interfa interface. I forgot. Sorry for that. Or you can say, ah, yeah, I know that I should use the interface, but I don't have time to do so because the deadline is approaching. Okay, then just document it. You know, document it in your architecture that there is another um, dependency there that you have to take care of if you do future implementations. Or what you can also do, of course, in our example of that prototype, that would probably be the solution. You just accepted the deviation temporarily, though. But no matter what path you take, you have full transparency about the real architecture of your code. So you will not run into surprises. You will not plan under false assumptions. You will always be 100% sure that the architecture that you see is the architecture that you have. So there's no differences between the architecture documented and the real implementation. So no matter if in case one, you just corrected the code and said, okay, I just fix it in the code, or you updated your architecture specification, or even in the case where you temporarily accepted that deviation, um, you will have the inf information available. Every developer has the information available on a day-to-day -day basis. The architects have the information available. and this is the big benefit of architecture testing because you can prevent bugs from happening. And that's, that's a good story about it. So no surprises and no surprises. That's a good thing in software development and software testing, I would say. And also what, what's helpful is if you do not have these bugs that arise in it, you don't need those workarounds that later on, as in our example, turn to clones or other problems that arise. So you, you prevent future bugs as well.
So since we still have a little time, um, I can show you how that looks in a real example. Um, I already told you that we have an own modeler that we ship. So if you say, okay, UML is too fancy for me on my project and I don't want to use Repsody or Enterprise Architect or any of these other tools, um, you're very welcome to use our modeler there, which is a no frills approach. So it's architecture documentation, period, because with no frills, that, that means that you can really focus on, on your job and are not um, distracted by functionalities that you actually don't need. So with that modeler, you can model your components, your architecture components and subcomponents and define the dependencies. So you can see here, you can uh, define what a component should be. Uh, what should consist of that component. You will also have a mapping to your code. So where is the corresponding code to these components? And when it comes to dependencies, you can um, define this dependency on a very, very high level. So you can say there's a source dependency. I don't really care what sort of dependency that is. Or you can really drill down and say it should be a call dependency or even more specific, a static call dependency. So you can always go as specific as you need it in your project, but you can also keep it on a very high level um, so that you don't, like if, if, you, if you don't really care, you can keep it very, very simple, your architecture, and still make sure that there's no deviation. And in this example, if you would have deviations, you would, you would see it like that. So as an architect, you could open the deviation view of your architecture where you could see, okay, the architecture is not 100% matching the code right now. And then an architect can make the decision whether the code should be fixed at certain, point, at certain places or if your architecture just needs an update that, or both of it in some parts. And for the developer, um, as I said, it's, it's the easiest way is to integrate it into the integrated development environment of the developer. So in our example here for Visual Studio, you would get an architecture deviation displayed right in your IDE with a little excerpt of how that deviation uh, looks like in, in the graph. So the developer can directly take actions if such a deviation arises. And of course, we have a nice uh, integration also into Vectorcast. And so any of you who are using Vectorcast, you will get this information about architecture deviations directly within Vectorcast. Jeff just uh, did a great video on that. I think it's still accessible. So um, contact uh, your contacts at Vector uh, to, to get a look at this video from Jeff on how the integration of Vectorcast and Exhibian works here. And I'm now very happy to meet you in the Q&A session and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.